Okay, let's unpack this. You hear about incredible things happening in science, things that used to be, well, the stuff of science fiction, really. Absolutely. It feels like the boundaries are constantly shifting. And today, we're diving deep into one of those moments. Picture the Ice Age, a tough world, right? And ruling alongside mammoths and saber-toothed cats was the dire wolf. A formidable predator. Yeah, these weren't your average wolves. They were built differently, stouter bodies, those incredibly robust skulls. Maybe familiar from Game of Thrones for some folks? Indeed, they have quite the pop culture profile now. So here's the headline. A US company, Colossal Biosciences, has made a truly astonishing announcement. They claim to have de-extincted the dire wolf. Right, they're talking about actual pups. Exactly. Three genetically engineered wolf pups, striking white fur apparently, and they're calling it the world's first successful de-extinction. Big claim. It really is the sheer ambition. Bringing back an animal that vanished, what, thousands of years ago, it makes you think about the power of modern science. It really does. And that's what this deep dive is all about for you listening. We've got information from Colossal Biosciences themselves, uh, and we're also looking at what outside experts are saying. Getting both sides of the story. Precisely. Our mission is to understand the science, you know, explore the different reactions, and help you get a handle on what this all means and the questions it raises. Sounds good. So these dire wolves, they weren't just legends, were they? They were real. Oh, not at all. The fossil record is quite clear. Canis dirus, a very real, very successful predator across North and South America back in the day. And they vanished about 13,000 years ago. Roughly, yes. Coinciding with the end of the Ice Age, a period of massive environmental change that, you know, took out a lot of the big megafauna. Okay, 13,000 years, that's a, that's a long time. Uh. So how do you even begin to think about bringing something like that back? What was Colossal's approach here? Well, it wasn't about creating a perfect clone in the, let's say, traditional sci-fi sense. Their focus was really on the genetic information locked inside ancient DNA. Right, DNA from fossils. Exactly, they managed to retrieve it from fossilized remains. There was a tooth from Sheridan Pit in Ohio that one's about 13,000 years old. Okay. And also an inner ear bone from American Falls, Idaho, which is much older actually, around 72,000 years old. Wow, 72,000 years, that's ancient. It is, and these samples were absolutely key to piecing together the dire wolf's genetic makeup, or at least significant parts of it. Ancient DNA, it's like a genetic time machine. <laughs> so they had this blueprint or fragments of it. What then did they just stitch it together. Um, it's a bit more intricate than that. See, they didn't have a complete, perfectly preserved dire wolf genome to work with. Nobody does. So they looked to its closest living relative. Which turns out to be? The gray wolf. Uh. Colossal's work actually helped confirm this. There was some older research, some speculation, maybe jackals were closer relatives, but no. So not jackals, gray wolves. Right. The high quality dire wolf genome Colossal managed to assemble showed a 99.5% similarity in the DNA code between dire wolves and gray wolves. 99.5%. Wow, okay. That's a really close connection then. Extremely close. So they have the gray wolf DNA as the base, the foundation, and then they're using these specific bits of ancient dire wolf DNA. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting, isn't it? What happens next? This sounds like some, well, serious genetic engineering. It absolutely is. Colossal scientists pinpointed around 20 specific genes in gray wolves that they wanted to essentially edit. 20 genes. Why those ones? They believe these genes are key players in expressing some of those unique dire wolf traits. Things that might influence, say, jaw musculature, bone structure, contributing to that robust skull you mentioned earlier. Ah, I see. The characteristics that made them different. Precisely. They use the ancient dire wolf DNA sequences as a kind of template, editing the corresponding gray wolf genes to incorporate these dire wolf versions. Think of it like targeted updates to the gray wolf's genetic software based on the old dire wolf code. Okay, I think I'm following. Targeted updates. So they've got these genetically tweaked gray wolf cells. How do you get from cells in a dish to, you know, actual breathing, howling pups. Right, that's the next big step. This is where cloning technology enters the picture. Once they had those edited cells, scientists created embryos in the lab using those cells. A standard cloning procedure, basically. Sort of, yes. Then these embryos were implanted into surrogate mothers, and this is quite remarkable. They used domesticated dogs as the surrogates. We really, domestic dogs carried these proto-dire wolves. That's right. Three different dogs successfully carried the embryos to term and gave birth. Wow. So these de-extincted dire wolves 
literally had golden retrievers or something as their moms. That's an image. <laughs> it is quite something to picture, isn't it? And then, yes, the big reveal, three pups with this very striking white fur. Okay, tell me more about these pups. What are they like? And the big question, are they dire wolves or modified gray wolves? What's the story there? Well, they're certainly getting attention. Uh. White fur is very noticeable. You've got two males named Romulus and Remus. Uh. Nice nod to the Roman legend, the she-wolf founders. Exactly. And one female named Khaleesi. Ah, the Game of Thrones connection again. Okay. And what's significant is their size and how fast they're growing. At just six months old, Romulus and Remus are already around 80 pounds or 36 kilos. 80 pounds at six months. It's big for a wolf pup, isn't it? It's quite substantial, yes. Khaleesi, the female, she's younger, about two months old, and around 25 pounds or 11 kilos. Okay. And Colossal is projecting they could eventually hit 100 to 150 pounds, that's 45 to 68 kilos, and stand maybe 32 to 40 inches tall at the shoulder. How does that compare to the original dire wolves? Well, estimates suggest adult dire wolves were maybe up to 25% larger than modern gray wolves. They definitely had that wider head, a much stronger bite force. Mm. So these pups seem to be tracking towards that larger size profile. So physically, they're already showing hints of those bigger, more robust traits. That's pretty fascinating. But okay, this really brings us right back to that central question for anyone listening. Is this really a de-extincted dire wolf? Exactly. Because I know that outside experts, well, they've voiced some skepticism, haven't they, about using that specific term, de-extincted. They have, and this is really the crux of the matter. Colossal Biosciences and their chief science officer, Beth Shapiro, is a key voice here. They frame their success differently. How so? They talk about bringing back functional ecological traits, the things that made the dire wolf unique in its ecosystem, its role. Ah, okay. So less about a perfect genetic copy, more about the job it did. Kind of. Shapiro argues that, you know, our idea of a species is a human classification, a label. And maybe the real goal of de-extinction should be about restoring lost ecological functions, boosting biodiversity that way. Hmm, that's an interesting perspective. Like, even if you had a perfect genetic clone, the world has changed so much, maybe it couldn't fulfill its old role anyway? That's part of the thinking, yes. Colossal seems focused on the animal's potential impact within an ecosystem, its place in the food web, how it might interact with other species. Okay, that makes a certain kind of ecological sense. But then you have the, let's say, stricter scientific definition of bringing back an extinct species. Precisely. And that's where the caution comes in from outside experts like Corey Bradshaw. He's a professor of global ecology at Flinders University. And what's his take? He's described these pups as essentially slightly genetically modified gray wolves. Ooh, okay. That's a very different framing. It is. His reasoning is that while, yes, the genetic modifications come from dire wolf DNA, the pups aren't a full resurrection of the complete original dire wolf genome. They are, in his view, fundamentally gray wolves, just with some altered traits, not true dire wolves brought back. So it really boils down to how you define the extinction, doesn't it? Absolutely. Is the goal a 100% perfect genetic match to the extinct animal? Or is it about recreating something that behaves like it, fulfills a similar ecological niche, and carries key genetic markers? There's no single answer yet, is there? Not really. It highlights just how complex this whole endeavor is. Genetically, these pups are overwhelmingly gray wolf, right? But they carry these specific targeted edits meant to bring back dire wolf features. So it raises that fundamental question for all of us, really. At what point does modifying a close relative become, you know, bringing back the extinct one? Exactly. It's a fascinating scientific debate, but it's also got philosophical dimensions. It's really pushing the boundaries of how we think about species and extinction. It's almost like a biological thought experiment playing out in real life. Yeah. What is a dire wolf? Just the DNA sequence. Yeah. Or the sum of its traits and its role. Hmm. Now, Colossal also mentioned their work shed new light on the dire wolf's own history. Yes, that was another interesting outcome. Their high-quality genome analysis suggested the dire wolf lineage actually emerged relatively recently in evolutionary time, somewhere between, say, 3.5 and 2.5 million years ago. Okay, relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. Right. And perhaps more surprisingly, they determined this emergence was likely due to a hybridization event. Hybridization, meaning? A genetic mixing between two older, distinct lineages of canids, of dog-like ancestors. So the dire wolf itself might have originated from a blend of ancient types. Huh. 
So even the original dire wolf wasn't pure in a sense, it came from mixing. That's fascinating. It is. And it kind of underscores again that close evolutionary link to the gray wolf. They both inherited big chunks of their genetics from these shared ancient ancestors. That's a really neat piece of the puzzle, actually. Okay, so what's happening with these pups now? Are they just in a lab somewhere? Is there a bigger plan? Well, according to the information released, the pups are apparently doing well. They're living in a secure ecological preserve. A preserve. Great. Like a wildlife park. Something like that, described as spanning over 2,000 acres. The exact location hasn't been specified, but putting them in a large naturalistic setting certainly suggests they're thinking long-term about their welfare and maybe future studies. Right, not just keeping them in cages. Seems not. And Beth Shapiro from Colossal also brought up an interesting point about the potential cultural significance. Cultural significance, how so? Well, for some extinct species, like the dire wolf potentially, they might hold meaning for indigenous peoples or represent a deep part of human history on a continent. She suggested that restoring such species or animals very like them could maybe help preserve cultural heritage or connect us more tangibly to that deep past. That's another layer I hadn't really considered, the human connection to these lost animals. It adds another dimension to the discussion beyond just the pure science or ecology. But it feels like we keep circling back to this core tension, don't we? Colossal saying, we did it, de-extinction, and outside experts saying, hang on, they're modified gray wool. Precisely. It perfectly highlights that there isn't, you know, a, a universally agreed upon checklist for what counts as de-extinction. This announcement is almost certainly going to fuel much more debate. In the scientific community and probably um, just among regular people too, right? Absolutely. Debates about the science, the accuracy of the claims, the ethics, which is a whole other huge topic we haven't even really touched on, and just the implications of trying to bring back extinct life forms, or at least very close functional proxies. Okay, so let's try and sum this up for everyone listening. Colossal Biosciences says they've de-extincted the dire wolf. They did this by editing gray wolf genes using ancient dire wolf DNA. Resulting in three pups, the white fur showing signs of being larger, like dire wolves. Right, and Colossal's argument is focused on bringing back the dire wolf's ecological role. But other experts are more cautious, calling them genetically modified gray wolves because they aren't a complete genetic copy of the original. And the science itself shows dire wolves and gray wolves are incredibly closely related, sharing 99.5% DNA, with the dire wolf line itself potentially arising from ancient hybridization. And these pups, they're now living in a large preserve raising questions about the long-term goals. Okay, that covers the main points. I think. Yes, that's a good handle on the situation as presented. So for you, our listener, here's the big question to really chew on after all this. When you consider everything, the amazing complexity of genetics, the immense time scales of evolution, even just how fuzzy our human definitions of species can sometimes be, what does de-extinction truly mean to you? Hmm. Is it about getting that perfect genetic blueprint back from the past? Or is it more about restoring those lost ecological jobs, the functions within an ecosystem? Or maybe it's something else entirely. And stepping back, what are the broader implications, ethical, ecological system, of heading down this path? Think about the different perspectives we've talked about today. What parts of this story resonate most with you? What excites you? And what, if anything, gives you pause as science potentially gains the power to reshape life on Earth in this way?